And thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm your host, Daniel Davis. We find ourselves, as we're approaching midlife and beyond, still working in the workplace. In fact, it's more unlikely that people will retire this day and age than what it used to be back in the industrial ages. Go to school, get a good education, get a great career, and just basically hang on until you build that nice retirement egg and you settle down and watch the sunset and go fishing as it rises early in the morning every day. Not happening so much this day and age, but then we became be finding ourselves in a different set of circumstances where we're dealing with many different generations in the workplace as we get older. And along with that, of course, are different points of view, different opinions, and different ways of thinking and being. How do we deal with this kind of a situation where we got to have to work together and be able to communicate well together as well? With us here on the Beyond 50 radio program is a certified executive performance coach, and she's going to talk with us about how we can effectively communicate and work well in the intergenerational workplace. And I'd like to welcome to our program Kathy Condon, and she's going to talk with us about that very thing, so that way we don't have to think about pulling our hair out, but we can actually work together, perhaps in harmony and bliss. And Kathy Condon, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today. Well, and greetings from Vancouver, Washington, which we're at about 100 degrees at the moment. (laughs) Yeah, nothing like the Northwest turning into the big baked turkey, huh? (laughs) That's correct, right, absolutely. Now, you've been doing your kind of work for quite a while now. Tell us about your experience. Well, actually, I started out as an executive coach, uh, helping people figure out what it is that they wanted to do when they grow up, and my a Y genera- X generation daughter wasn't real thrilled with the way I described it, but those of us who are over 40 realize that indeed many of us are not doing what we really love to do. Mm-hmm. So, I, first of all, I developed a system to help figure out what people really should be doing, their talents, and so on. And then I moved into teaching networking. And all of a sudden, there were numerous people teaching networking. This was back probably about six, seven years ago. And I could see on the horizon where there was going to become a conflict with the intergenerational groups altogether. And I began my research to figure out how could I present to a person, um, whether or not I was an executive or a manager on some staff or even at home taking care of your kids, how could I put it in simple words so that they could understand just maybe what the issues were that were going on at the moment? So that's basically how I got started. Mm. Now, I know this day and age, it's funny because as I was even approached with this particular segment here, I started thinking about my own experiences when it comes to the workplace and relating even with younger people. Now, I know that I remember being a young person and saying, oh, How come it seems like the adults at times have it in for me? And then as I got older, I find myself with that same attitude toward the young. (laughs) And you kind of leave your head scratching. You know, it's like, uh, for instance, this day and age, it seems to me, and I'm talking about, say, teenage kids this day and age, they feel like things should just be given to them. And if they don't get it, then they, you know, then they just sit around until they do. And I thought to myself back in the day, you know, if my parents, for instance, said, well, you know, we can't afford to go and get you this toy, for instance, I'd get out and I'd hustle and find a way to go and get it. You know, but this day and age, I just sit and it seems like they just wait around for somebody to hand them something. So is it just my skewed thinking about this generation and, and, you know, and how do we bridge that gap, it seems? Well, first of all, I hate to say this, but I will. You're probably responsible for the kids acting that way, or those of us (laughs) who are boomer baby boomers. Uh So what happened is the baby boomers, uh, there were so many of us in the workplace. So there's approximately 80 million, and before us, the veterans' generation, which would be 63 and above, we had a huge number of people in the workforce. And in order to keep moving ahead in our careers, we had to work really, really hard because we knew if we didn't, someone was looking over our shoulder and they would get our job. Mm -hmm. So what happened is is we started working long, long hours, uh, coming home late at night. And, you know, you've heard the term latchkey kids. Right. This is this is when the latchkey kids came into place. And so all of a sudden they were home alone, had to figure out things on their own. And so they, when they started having children, they're saying, I am going to be around for my kids. I am ah. not going to be working. 
And as a result, the Y generation, which is 26 and below, which are many of the X generation kids now at this point, because we go all the way down to seven years old, the X generation says, I'm going to take care of my kids, and they're going to have what I want that I didn't have. Ah, I see. You see how we built that up ourselves? Yeah, that seems to be totally true now. And then you see this generation going into the workforce, and you have several different intergenerational things going on now. Is it just the age difference that gives us a hard time in communication and barriers, or what exactly is it? I absolutely believe that it is not that. In fact, I went to teach at the National League of Cities to the mayors and city council members in a half-day class, and it was called Intergenerational Communications, Tools for Your Constituents. And I remember the time I walked in there, and I said, for the next two hours, I am not going to talk about intergenerational uh, uh, differences. And you're seeing the look on their face, like, okay, great. This is what I paid for. I'm not going to get. But it is my belief very, very strongly that there is a lot of other influences that are taking place other than intergenerational and then age. And first of all, I also would like to say, particularly the X generation just really dislikes being categorized. That's, you know, practically the death of them. If you hear, I'm not like everyone else. I'm an individual. So I went in there and started talking to them first, and I started brainstorming with them. And I said, okay, so tell me what are the things that have influenced your life? And so they talked about parents. They talked about religion. And one of my favorite questions is how many of you have lived outside the country, born in another country or outside the country, longer than two years? And, of course, the hands always go up. Next question is, did that change your life? And immediately they respond, absolutely. And there's the other piece that really hasn't been getting any emphasis on, in my belief, is that the personality types. You know, we all know, of, we've all gone through the Myers-Briggs and, and an I'm Certified Interact, which, you know, breaks it down differently. However, there are different kinds of personality. Some are very analytical, you know, just give me the numbers. Some are marketers, you know, and it goes on. So those become involved. Religion, culture. Um, I have a German background and an Irish background mixed together, and, and many of my traditions in my family cause that. So this is where I'm at in regarding intergenerational communications is I feel it is a very strong, powerful part of the problem because there are certain characteristics that you can see generally fit it. But my real belief is communications is this, three points. Number one, help a person feel important or significant. That doesn't make any difference what age you are. It is it's still important. Number two is that you need to ask questions, and particularly as we continue this conversation, we'll talk about rewards down the road for these generations. What do you want and what success look like to you? The third point is, is if you're going to ask the question, make sure you listen to the answer, and we've gotten really, really bad up at that. We ask rote questions like, hi, how are you, which happens to be my favorite worst question in the whole world. (laughs) Yeah, because, you know, it's just so rote. Nobody cares. Do you really care how you are? And you ask, you know, someone with all kinds of aches and pains, they will tell you everything. Right. And then finally, I believe the fourth, and I'm going to throw in the fourth bonus point here, is that if you're going to tell somebody that a project or something needs to be done, you need to give them the why. Why do we need to do it? So all of those things, I believe, have a lot, lot more importance than how old someone is. Well, that certainly makes a lot of sense when you put it into that context. Now, you were saying now in a way that this is, sort of categorizing, but that people really don't like to be categorized. Is that true? Absolutely. Yeah, in fact, you will. Uh, frankly, when I do intergenerational communication as a workshop, I honestly normally win over the X generation because I become big proponents of them because I understand how they want things presented to them. 
but you can immediately see their body language change when I say, well, you know, the Y generation are the people that are ages between 43 and 28, and then start talking about the characteristics. They will even kind of shut down in the classroom until I bring them back again, because they're individuals. They operate as an individual person, and they will get help when they need it, but they are not team-oriented like the baby, baby boomers are. Oh, okay. That's very different. Now, how about the Y generation? What do you see there? Well, interesting. uh, We're having a really interesting look at them. Number one is officially uh, they're putting in the age of 27 to 9 years old. And it looks like that age difference is going to be changed a little bit because of the fact they are discovering, researchers who work on all this generational material, is that it is really more correct to use significant events that happen to to uh, use as markers. And what they're thinking now, the Y generation probably will start from seven years old because that would be when 9-11 occurred. And their feeling is that that event had major impact on the Y generation as well. They were old enough to understand what went on. And then we go back to, and I, I want to point out something that I found regarding the baby boomers that totally blows people away, and it's always so evident when I'm training in a class, that the age of the baby boomers is uh, 63 uh, to 44 at this point. And what's fascinating about this is I have all the baby boomers in the room stand up. So they stand up, and then I say, If you remember where you were when John F. Kennedy was killed, sit down. And what do you think happens? Uh, That's an interesting question. I know for me, I wouldn't have been one to sit down because at that particular... Actually, he was assassinated, I believe it was a year before I was born. See, there you go. Mm -hmm. See, the thing of it is is that we're calling all of these people baby boomers. Right. 80 million of them. And usually there are six people. If Say I had a room of uh, 150. Six to eight people will be standing. They have no idea. But yet we're trying to categorize them and put them all in the same basket. You see, kind of seeing why the holes work when you try right. to categorize people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's, you know, that's quite interesting. So I can see how when you say, well, you're part of the X generation, you still have unique individuals because of the age differences that are within that group and the experiences as well, as well as going along with 9-11. So here's, I guess, a, a key question for this. When it comes to the workplace and diversified ages, how many different generations are found commonly within the workplace? Is it dependent on the type of work that it is or career or what is it exactly? Well, it is appearing there's four okay. at this point. You know, it's you know it's the veterans generation. It is the baby boomers, the X, and the Y at this point. And the Y generation is the group that you know they're coming out of college now, so they're moving in, and there does not seem to be any delineations within any industry where I could say okay, no, they don't have any Y generation. Because, frankly, we need the Y generation's technology background. Um, They are are really much more technically up-to-date than many of the X generation is. As an example, my daughter, who is 36 years old, uh, who is a baby, is an X generation person, when she graduated from high school at her graduation party, that night, she won the biggest gift of the evening, and it happened to be a word processor. Mm. So you see, at 35 years old, computers were just, they didn't have them in the classroom yet. And the word processor that she was going off to college with a word processor, man, we were so excited. But you see, so wait, below that are all the people who have been around computers on a regular basis, which, of course, technology is just a gigantic impact. So the X generation, many of them, I also was working on a major project, Motorola, outside of Chicago, and they downsized. 
and I was working. I wanted to see how good I would be working in the middle of the night helping the people who were on the night shift. It turns out you don't want to hire me to train in the middle of the night. But, <laughs> <laughs> but what happened is I just saw a clear blue sky. There were 26 people in the room that worked on the night shift, and I asked them to raise their hand how many of them knew how to use a computer. And this was only four years ago, and none of them who were on that manufacturing line knew how to use a computer. Wow. So you see, we can't can't say what the ages are all mixed in through all the industries now and their capabilities. That's why, I, frankly, if I see a resume and they do not have their computer skills on it, I'd say put your computer skills on it because you can't take it for granted that everybody knows mm-hmm. those things. Yeah, because I noticed that even as we talk about the Y generation, that this is also a group that would rather read text messages than a book. You know, it's almost as though books are becoming obsolete except for being necessary in school. Well, and again, Harry Potter, that's the only one of the main main advantages of Harry Potter drove a lot of people back to books. Mm-hmm. And and it's not as it's, there's a lot more wide generation reading books than we tend to think, from my experience anyway. But there is no question. In fact, my sister and I just had this conversation today. She is uh, a veteran's generation. I'm baby boomer. And we were talking about somehow about the reason about reading books. And I said, you know, after I'm at the computer all day, I just don't really feel like reading books, that, but I'm forcing myself to turn it off and go read at night. And she made that same comment because she said many of the books that she used to read, she's now at the computer. But again, she loves technology ten times more than I do, so she spends <laughs> more time there than I do. I know, because it seems interesting to think about that situation, say, with a Generation Y and the perception that, let's say, the baby boomer generation might have of this generation just being lazy and uncaring when, in fact, that's not really true. They're just, the way they process or even gather information is just a lot different. Very, and that's why, I mean, frankly, I can get a lot of baby boomer, and, you know, it's interesting, and I don't mean to sort out men and women, but in this particular case, I watch this over and over. Um, If I have, I, I mean, I love it when there's a mixed, audience of all the the generations in the same group. And so what happens is I'm starting to watch how the baby boomer men fold their arms, move back, body language, yeah, right. Not really thinking that I'm on the right track with this thing because, again, they're so used to being the managers and all of their life, and many of them, of course, are older baby boomers, Mm-hmm. probably haven't had the opportunity to learn all the technology. You know, things. I, you know, I don't want to make a generalization here because there's a lot of baby boomers, you know, and I'm, I actually include myself in that, that I know it's important to learn technology, so I keep moving my way through. Yet, no matter what, I doubt whether or not they would be able to have as many skills in many aspects as the Y generation does because the minute that they had school, you know, and I have a grandson at three years old, and I'm I'm wondering how they're going to handle technology with him. But you see, the Y generation has had technology be part of their life all along, and I and I just you know read something the other day, and you think they don't have a clue what a vinyl record is. Of course, I guess they're coming back now, but there's a <laughs> fax machine. They can't. They don't even know what a fax machine is in a right. lot of respects. Mm-hmm. So it's it's misunderstanding there, so I see it. I don't see. Now, just to even take a look, when you take a look at technology, it's quite interesting because I remember as I it was in the 70s when video ping pong first came on the scene. And, you know, you played it for a while, but you eventually got a little bit bored, and then eventually you had the Atari video game systems, and then it just evolved all the way to what we see today. Then you could spend some time as a kid, I remember, playing the video games, but eventually you got bored and you wanted to go outside and go do something else. But today they could spend days. (laughs) You know, it's like, you know, just make sure you get them a a steady supply of food, but they could just stay affixed to that. And it's amazing how their attention span can stay fixed on that one single thing that for someone like, say, I was describing myself, I just kind of would get bored and want to go do something else. 
Well, it's it's interesting you say that because I literally just had a girlfriend who was a baby boomer say to me, I am so bored, it is so hot, I can't go outside, and she's not into technology. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, time for you to pick up the books, Mal, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> and But it is also true that the technology pieces, when they... They well, this is another aspect again. My sister and I are, you know, retro, uh, mother died a couple of years ago. We're getting back into thinking memories and stuff. Both of us went to one room schoolhouse for eight years, uh, mm-hmm. believe it or not. And I'm only 62, so I'm not 90 at this point. Okay. And we went to the one room schoolhouse, and we realized we are very, very good at multitasking. And my sister said, Kathleen, I know why. And I said, Well, why? She said, think about the one-room schoolhouse. There was a class going on the front. We were supposed to be doing our homework. Then the next thing you know, they would ask us to help do something else. And, you know, there was a lot of commotion always in that one-room schoolhouse that we went. So we know how to deal with it really well. And originally I started worrying about this Y generation because cheaper they can multitask. And she pointed out to me, Kathleen, we know how to do it, but we did it in a different way, came to the same space through a different way. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really interesting to take a look at these groups. And I know one we haven't touched on yet, but I think is vitally important is, uh, as we take a look at the U.S. military, for instance, and you had, you know, the age of World War II veterans, which, you know, are coming pretty close to the end of that generation in and of itself, which had patriotism and duty and honor, you know, and that it was uh, that you were respected. Then Vietnam came along, and that kind of really changed the playing field, and then you see the nature of how that interweaves in the different generations. How have you seen that played out that to the end at this day and age where you have a white generation that not only is so focused on technology but gets just about all of their information almost from the Internet and seeing something such as military and honor and duty and patriotism, how they see and experience and view that, or does it even make any sense to them? Well, would you want to – and it's a great question, and I think you're going to be kind of amazed at this answer – Um, I was in a classroom teaching the subject, and it came up talking about patriotism and so on. And a Y generation young lady raised her hand, and she said, Kathy, I would like to say something. And I said, great, what what do you have to say? And she said, because of 9-11, and this is the key, again, to see how events affect people. Because of 9-11, I went to my grandparents to ask them what was the world like before and what is patriotism. Because she said, I started seeing it, how everybody pulled together, and she said, I had some of the best conversations that I have ever had with my grandparents talking about this event. Mm-hmm. And I stood there and I went, wow. I mean, it was an amazing eye-opener to me. But this is the really wonderful news. The wonderful news is is that, you know, in the corporate world, and I really work to stress this a lot um, in executive coaching in the corporate world, that the idea of matching people together to help mentor them, we're, we're making too many assumptions when we have a new person on the job. Don't train them. Say, okay, here's your job. And they don't have any clue even where the bathroom is, not alone what is the culture of the whole group. So what is appearing to be an amazing match is taking a veterans generation person in a company and mentoring them with a Y and putting them with a Y generation and what they're finding out that is an outstanding match. Wow. That, well, why is that? I mean, I can see where where it makes sense, but from your perspective, your experience. From my experience is the Y generation doesn't like the X generation too much. You know, they <laughs> now why they is y- that though? <laughs> I'm kinda curious. Well, the X generation, remember, is all individuals. Okay. You it's know, all about we me operate and, into, I got you. Yeah. And the Y generation is taught community service and team way back where it used to be. So in other words, so those two groups don't get along too well. Mm-hmm. And, but what happens, and in the baby boomer generation, and, you know, and you said it, people are 
standing back and looking, yeah, well, they just don't do their work and so on. Whereas the veterans generation is giving the why generation, and it sounds like I'm just repeating it, but they're giving you the why it's important. Ah, I see. So, okay, so let's take a look. We got, say, the World War II. When you say veterans, does that also include the Vietnam veterans as well? Absolutely. Well, okay. uh, tail end of it. Uh, actually, most of the Viet- Vietnamese, uh, Vietnam War veterans are are older baby boomers, like myself. Okay, okay. I'm 62. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I kind of wanted to be clear about call it a category, if you will, but that's not what what, I, what we're really meaning yeah. here. So, what you have is you have an X generation that says it's all about me, and then if I've got enough left over, maybe I'll help somebody else. That's just how they were. From uh, a baby boomer standpoint, that created these children in light of being independent, possibly, I, and Catch me if I'm maybe skewering this a little bit. So there's the reason that the Y generation doesn't really communicate or fit well with those generations there. However, you go back above and beyond that, and you get back to the Y because the Y generation literally wants to not only know why, but how they can be part of a community and part of a solution. Is that what it is? Absolutely, and okay. they also believe, the, the veteran generation also believes, and this is what's interesting, that leadership comes from the top. So think of a pyramid. Right. So the, vet, the veterans are, so let me see if I can paint these pictures of the diagrams for you. The veteran generation is leadership at the top. The baby boomer generation, think of a flat line with a bunch of lines on it so that shows we're a team and we're all equal. Okay. The X generation is you have circles, all individual circles, and then arrows that they work with each other when they need to. They're phenomenal at finding resources. Better, mm-hmm. the best generation in the world for that. And now you move back to the Y generation, and if you were going to draw a pyramid, you, what you do to describe the the um, Y generation is think of a pyramid with broken lines around it and a circle at the top. And why is that the case? Well, this is also one of the issues that's starting to come up with the Y generation is this, is that, you see, we're moving back to leadership at the top because uh, the veterans, I mean, uh, baby boomers went against the veterans saying, you know, we're not going to have leadership at the top. We're going to be a team. So then the X generation says, well, we see the team. We don't want to be in a team. We want to be ourselves. <laughs> you know, now we're moving back to that pyramid again, and the Y generation is working um, together on a project that is assigned. Like, for example, in most high schools, which is great, they're given community service projects and they all work on them. The only issue is is that we're having a little hard time having those leaders jump out because often it's the teacher that assigns the project and then they all do it. Mm -hmm. But if you can visualize a broken pyramid with leadership at the top, that's how the Y generation is starting to work together. So you can see why it matches the veterans generation. Mm -hmm. Well, that certainly makes a lot of sense. It kind of makes me wonder, though, let's say as the boomer group or the X generation group, what are effective ways to be able to communicate or participate uh, with the intergenerational situation altogether? Is it by understanding what potential category, for lack of a better word, that you're in or that anybody else is in? Or how do you bring all this together, sort of do the toss salad, if you will? Okay, I'm going to go back to my three points. You've got to make every person in front of you feel important. Okay. It's, it's not about what age they are, but you've got to, and I think what we're going to do is I understand that we're going to have another session right. on this so we can really get into the reward system for each one of these groups. But, again, if you just go along and assume this is the way it is. I'll give you an example. X generation, I heard an X generation person give a presentation on intergenerational communication, so I'm sitting there. And she says, in, she says from the front of the room, she said, you know, the thing that really irritates me is that the baby boomers, all, keywords she used, all. <laughs> want to know all the details of how something was put together before they move forward. You know, and I was sitting there going, you know what, it's not what I want, just give me the facts. And so it gets back to 
knowing the individual that is sitting in front of you at the very moment, what, how do they need the material presented? Do they need it presented, you know, um, on the phone, emails? I got one time I was I was talking about note cards and asked, okay, so how are note cards? Do you want note cards or phone calls? when somebody does something from you. And the whole group got in the big art. Oh, emails or um, I was projecting that we should send handwritten note cards. So they got in the big argument, no, we only want emails in the other side of the room. says, no, we all want a voicemail. And they were all arguing. They couldn't agree <laughs> which one they really want, which proved my point that a note card would be different. And but you've got the Y email. generation that just wants it delivered through MySpace. <laughs> exactly. However, I am willing to bet if you sent them a card in the mail and they got it and waiting for it, I, I am 100% convinced they'd be thrilled to death with it. You know, and I'm sure about that. I was just thinking the other day because we're so caught up in technology and emailing how unpersonal that really is that when was the last time you sent your child or, you know, even anybody just a letter, just a handwritten letter? And and I and you think to yourself that in all levels that I think each generation, if you will, will enjoy a multitude of different ways of approaching exactly what you're talking about here. I am absolutely convinced of it. And I have a girlfriend who has four teenagers um, in a situation where, you know, Christmas was very, there weren't a lot of funds for Christmas. Mm-hmm. Um, she ended up writing them all a letter. That was a Christmas gift. And she actually got an email from one of their sons, wrote her by email and said, Mom, that was the best Christmas present we've ever got. <laughs> and these are all Y generation. Mm-hmm. You know, you and know, on that point, if I may, uh, uh, just bring this up. I remember it was uh, several Christmases ago uh, I had been working in the restaurant industry, and so you've got a multitude of generations even in that, but generally it's more of the why, you know, give or take, it, it, depending on where you go. And I sat down by a fire, and I bought a bunch of Christmas cards, and each and every person that I worked with, I gave them a Christmas card, but also within that card, I wrote what was unique about our relationship, where only I and them knew and understood what that was. And it was interesting to see, especially the younger people, as they opened this up, that you actually wrote something in it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. they just got excited and were jumping out of their skin. So you can see how even the old world ways of doing things can excite any of the generations, I would think. Well, and, you know, and very frankly, I, I don't know if you, you know, I do have a book called It Doesn't Hurt to Ask. It's all about communications. And I wrote that book because I was believing a lot of this simple stuff, either we forgot it mm-hmm. or we never knew it. And to many people, they never did get the information. Um, particularly in the Y generation, seems like, you know, some of the simple things like in schools, I was was convinced that they're not teaching shaking hands in school, and I'm told, yes, they are, but I'm not convinced that they are. (laughs) Well, not only that, Kathy, if I may hit on a point, yeah, etiquette is one thing that I've noticed. You know, that yeah. you just, you'll see it, but it it doesn't seem like it was when I was a child. You know, please and thank you, introducing yourself, as you said, handshakes. But the other thing, too, that I found alarming a little bit as well is just basic writing skills, the ability to write cursiveness. Is that even well, being taught? You know, so well, I hear where you're coming from. Yeah, and actually, uh, I... <laughs> I've got to admit, my 35-year-old daughter said, "Mom, I never use cursive. I print everything." <laughs> you know, and you know, now that I think back on it, yeah, it's really case. But you know, big deal. Who cares if it's cursive? You know, or right. whatever. But yeah, it's it's back to. In fact, so often I just kind of chuckle to myself and going, "Yeah, but it's so simple." But the point is, it is not simple if you don't know. Right. And that's why I kind of got on this mode of the intergenerational communication. I'm just so tired of people saying, that's because how old they are. That's their age. There are a lot of other factors. But Mm -hmm. probably the biggest one, people join gangs and things because they want to feel important. And the technology piece, why I love it, it's still taking away Anybody feeling significant? Like I just wrote on LinkedIn, one of the things that just bugs me, you know, and LinkedIn is going to invite you to, I would like to invite you to my professional, you know, and people don't change the wording to say, Kathy, 
I would like you to join for this reason, so whatever. Because it's just simple as to send something that is just rote mm-hmm. out all the time. And I'm coming to the point that the the simple stuff, because people need to feel that they matter in this world. And technology is kind of moving us away from it, I'm believing, at this point, because you get too easy to generalize things. Well, you take a look at, for instance, the cell phone. You know, we can have, for instance, our own teenage daughter sitting, having dinner, and she's sitting there on the phone or text messaging like she's not even part of the group. Yes. And you think, okay, wait a minute, what do we do about that? Well, and again, it gets back to etiquette. So who do you suppose would be the one to say there will be no cell phone at the table? Exactly. Okay. You you see. uh, But what's funny is here you're part of a group, you know, you're included, but you want to be isolated and over here with a group you'd rather be with, it seems like. And, and, And that actually I'm seeing more and more even in the older ages as well as they start to grab onto something like this. I want to be isolated, but I want to be connected, but virtually in my own way. Well, and again, it, you know, we're picking up a lot of trades from the next year. You know, and I want to make sure uh, next time we cover, I certainly don't want to give the X generation a bad rap because no, they're not. they're they're making incredible contributions to this world, and you know, in all kinds of ways. So I think I was a little hard on the X generation. So I don't want the listeners to go, okay, so she doesn't like the X generation. Not the case. I think every generation has some incredible things to bring to the party here. But I think it behooves all of us to get back to basic communications. Um, there's a wonderful exercise that I do where you take a word like and, and use the word teacher or instructor, and you can have a whole room full of people, and each table gets to choose which of the words that they want to use. And then you ask everyone to write down 10 things that describe that word. So in other words, let's say it was instructor. So when you think mm-hmm. of instructor, you put 10 words down. And the truth is, they get a point every time all 10 of them get the same word. And it boils down to the fact, let's say you had 30 tables in a room, maybe one table would get one or two words that match. Wow. We do not know what the words are that we're using because of the way we were brought up and all those things that affected in our life. And we are afraid to ask the question, what do you mean by that? So, you know, we've heard the old thing, what does success mean to you? But I was in a situation one time that what does the word wonderful mean to you? You know, it's we have different perceptions of what words mean, and then we go into the workplace and we're trying to use our whole world the way we developed our own filters to look at it, and we're not asking enough questions to find out what's really going on. Mm -hmm. I remember there was a time and a place that I worked many years ago where they brought in a new manager who just all of a sudden, as you typically see with new management turnovers, they come in and they want to impose and implement a system. Okay, So eventually we were out one night, and she simply asked, what can I do? And I said, well... If you want to know my personal opinion, I'll give it to you. As a leader, what you should have done is come in and see how the engine is working just as it is and then find ways that if you feel necessary to tweak and possibly maximize its performance through people. What you decided to do was come in and impose a whole different system of doing things and that's why your group is frustrated because they don't have any input. No, and again, they feel like, you know, and especially, again, if they're not team-oriented, they they would be on the team in the first place. <laughs> exactly. You know, they're going like, man, I don't want to be on this team. Let me just yeah. do my work. <laughs> exactly. Now, and, and, go ahead. And there are the personality types. I mean, when I'm helping people figure out what it is they want to do, uh, there are people who are meant to be behind a computer day after day. Mm-hmm. Uh, but... You know, a lot of people like myself, that wouldn't work for me at all. I don't even have a home. I have a home office so I can go meet people out in the world because I don't want to be in the same 
four walls all the time. <laughs> you know, so it's personality types really have a big, big influence on this stuff. So really it isn't about age. Generation can kind of help us get a perception, if you will, of where a person's coming from, but you gave three key points earlier in the program that we should follow that would really make this a lot smoother in an intergenerational situation. I'd like for you to go ahead and, and say those again. Okay, so number one is help a person feel important or significant. Mm -hmm. Number two is ask questions. And again, keep in mind, if you use an acronym or an industry word, there's a strong chance you don't have a clue what that word means. So ask questions when you don't understand something, and then that person will feel more significant because they know you're really listening to them. Mm -hmm. And the third one is listen to the answer. Right. Don't just say, oh, yeah, okay, fine, and not, you know, just being engaged in that person and listen to the answer. And the key thing is that if you listen to the answer, more than likely there will be another thing. I teach us in networking all the time that there's a something that they said which will trigger you. Just like we are able to carry on the conversation we are, we're listening to each other. You're thinking of questions to ask me. And the conversation can keep going, and understanding comes by answering, asking more questions. Mm -hmm. And then finally, if you are giving directions to anyone, and I think this is um, the, the X and the Y generation really need it, but I figured out as a baby boomer, I need it. If I'm supposed to go do a job, and there is like an example. I was working on a project in Dallas. There was some paperwork I was supposed to fill out after meeting with individuals, and I just didn't do it, and everybody else was. And I was too busy, wasn't going to do it. And one night, the executive, um, the receptionist sat at the desk, Kathy, we need you to fill out the papers because. And all of a sudden, I went, oh, that makes sense. And from then on, it wasn't an issue for me to fill the papers out. Ah, very good. Well, you know, this is, again, we're going to be revisiting this in a little more detail, in a lot more detail, I'm sure, on, a, on another segment here. But could you go ahead and give out a website for people to find out more about uh, what you're talking about here? I know that you also have it's a, a newsletter as well. I do, and I have Weekly Wisdom, which I'm very proud is seven years old. Congratulations. Thank you. It's you stayed with the technology long enough to actually create something good. <laughs> I did, and uh, especially feels good when people leave their job and say, "Would you change my address?" That, in fact, I have one of those, two of those on my email right now. Uh, what it is, it's a quote that I find out in the world, and it's not a quote like the throw and all those who are interested. It could be from a movie or a conversation. Then I write four and a half lines why I like it, and then I ask a question. And they come out on Monday, and they're really positive, um, positive questions and it just puts you in the right frame of mind on a Monday morning. And where you can find that is in the upper right-hand corner of my website, you also can um, download 50 free networking tips on my website, same page. And my website is uh, www.kathy, and so with a K, Condon, C O N D O N, and then it's a dot info, I N F O. Well, very good. Again, you know, it's a pleasure to be able to bring, because we've actually touched on this subject uh, many different ways over the more than five years we've been doing our program. And it's always good to gain new insights so you don't feel like. Here I am, an older generation person or a younger generation person, and we just, I could care less about trying to understand them at all. But the fact is, as people, we do have to live and work together. That's just the way it is. And certainly if the process can be a lot smoother, more compassionate, more empathetic, I think it would be a lot better for everybody. Well, and I would like to look, to uh, look, end this conversation on a really fun note. I don't know if you remember, but we found each other on Twitter. <laughs> yes, exactly. And so, which, you know, everybody was wondering if Twitter pays off or whatever, and I frankly have really enjoyed the conversation, and I do have a great deal more information to share. But I think here we are talking about personal invitation, personal interaction, but it was Twitter where I found out about you all. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you, Kathy Condon, for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. It's been a pleasure. Great. So there you have it. It's not about age. Just learn to reach out and seek to understand and then be understood. I believe Stephen Covey once said that, and I found that to be very effective. Understand the other person. Also understand yourself as well. 
Thank you for tuning in. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. Be sure to visit us at our website at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. And sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter. Also be sure to visit us at our blog where we have plenty of archived resources and shows for you to tune into and even pass along to friends as well. Thank you again for tuning in. I'm Daniel Davis. Remember, live your day past halfway.